This paper from 1975 by Mary Claire King and A.C. Wilson entitled Evolution at Two Levels in Humans and Chimpanzees is interesting to look at. Dr. David Belinsky in his book The Devil's Delusion puts it like this. In Science, 1975, M.C. King and A.C. Wilson were the first to publish a paper estimating the degree of similarity between the human and the chimpanzee genome. This documented the degree of genetic similarity between the two, approximately 99% amino acid similarity. The study, using a limited data set, found that we are far more similar than was thought possible at the time. Hence, we must be one with the apes, mustn't we? But in the second section of their paper, King and Wilson honestly described the deficiencies of such reasoning. The molecular similarity between chimpanzees and humans is extraordinary because they differ far more than sibling species in anatomy and way of life. Although humans and chimpanzees are rather similar in the structure of the thorax and arms, they differ substantially not only in brain size, but also in the anatomy of the pelvis, foot, and jaws, as well as in relative lengths of limbs and digits. Humans and chimpanzees also differ significantly in many other anatomical respects to the extent that nearly every bone in the body of a chimpanzee is readily distinguishable in shape or size from its human counterpart. Associated with these anatomical differences, there are, of course, major differences in posture, mode of locomotion, methods of procuring food, and means of communication. Because of these major differences in anatomy and way of life, biologists place the two species not just in separate genera, but in separate families. So it appears that molecular and organismal methods of evaluating the chimpanzee-human difference yield quite different conclusions. Berlinski go on, goes on to state, King and Wilson went on to suggest that the morphological and behavioral differences between humans and apes must be due to variations in their genomic regulatory systems. For now, I would like to focus in on King and Wilson's claim that humans and chimpanzees also differ significantly in many other anatomical respects to the extent that nearly every bone in the body of a chimpanzee is readily distinguishable, distinguishable in shape or size from its human counterpart. This is a very interesting claim because, because of the following principle. If an engineer modifies the length of the piston rods in an internal combustion engine but does not mod modify the crankshaft accordingly, the engine won't start. Lynn Margulis puts the problem with Darwinian explanations like this. If you want bigger eggs, you keep selecting the hens that are laying the biggest eggs, and you get bigger and bigger eggs. But you also get hens with defective feathers and wobbly legs. In a paper entitled The Problem of Constraints on Variation from Darwin to the Present, Igor Popov states, Darwin tried rather unsuccessfully to solve the problem of the contradictions between his model of random variability and the existence of constraints. He was forced to admit some cases were creating anything humans may wish for was impossible, 
For example, when the English farmers decided to get cows with thick hams, they soon abandoned this attempt since they perished too frequently during delivery. The problem of the constraints on variation was not solved neither within the framework of the proper Darwin's theory nor within the framework of modern Darwinism. Thus, since, according to King and Wilson, nearly every bone in the body of a chimpanzee is readily distinguishable in shape or size from its human counterpart, you can now see how this places severe difficulties on Darwinian explanations since nearly every bone in the body of a chimpanzee would be, have to be modified simultaneously in order to affect a beneficial change. Moreover, in a paper from 2006 by John Grennan entitled The Morphological Enigma of Human and Great Ape Evolution, the author states, there remains, however, a paradoxical problem lurking within the wealth of DNA data. Our morphology and physiology have very little, if anything, uniquely in common with chimpanzees to corroborate a unique common ancestor. Most of the characters we do share with chimpanzees also occur in other primates, and in sexual biology and reproduction we could hardly be more different. It would be an understatement to think of this as an evolutionary puzzle. In fact, so great are the anatomical differences between humans and chimps that a Darwinist, since pigs turn out to be anatomically closer to humans than chimps are, actually proposed that a chimp and pig mated with each other, and that is what ultimately gave rise to humans. Here is the paper, A Chimp-Pig Hybrid Origin for Humans, and you can read it at your leisure. In it, he lists many uh, anatomical specializations. Moreover, since this goes against the Darwinian narrative that we came from chimps. Some Darwinists uh, opposed the pig-chimp hypothesis uh, very, very uh, angrily. And thus, therefore, Fizzorg published a subsequent article showing that the pig-chimp hybrid theory for human origins is much harder to shoot down than the hardcore Darwinists had thought it would be. And here's the article, Human Hybrids, A Closer Look at the Theory and Evidence. And they compared the traits, and it was always the pig-chimp hybrid hypothesis that won out. As to King and Wilson's suggestion that the morphological and behavioral differences between humans and apes must be due to variations in their genomic regulatory regions. It has now been found that there are orders of magnitude differences in the genomic regulatory systems. Uh, the following video clip and audio clip gets this point across clearly. Sternberg also did another presentation this last year. He called it, Why We're Not Chimps. And now that they, they have both the human genome and the chimpanzee genome fully sequenced, and now they're comparing the two. And yes, the structural genes are indeed 98% similar. But as I just showed you, the structural genes have little to do with what separates one organism from another. Where they really differ, and they differ by orders of magnitude, he's saying, is in the genomic architecture outside of the protein coding regions. They are vastly, vastly different, especially for those that have anything to do with brain function. 
the structural, the organization, the regulatory sequences, the hierarchy to how things are organized and used are vastly different between a chimpanzee and a, and a human being in their genomes. So that 98% that's supposedly junk is nothing but. Um, my point is that our DNA is ordered into a nested hierarchy of different data files. And here's the interesting thing. When you look at the protein coding sequences that you have in your cells, what you find is that they are nearly identical to the protein coding sequences of a dog, of a carp, of a fruit fly, of a nematode. They're virtually the same, and they are interchangeable. You can knock out a gene that encodes a protein for an inner ear bone in, say, a mouse. This has been done. Yeah, you've knocked it out. And then you can take a protein that's similar to it, but from a fruit fly. And fruit flies aren't vertebrates, and they certainly are not mammals, and therefore they don't have inner ear bones. And you can plug that gene in, and guess what happens? The mouse, or at least the offspring they have it, they have perfectly normal inner ear bones. So you can swap out all these files. So I'm mentioning this to you because when you hear about we're 99% similar, it's almost all referring to those protein coding regions. When you start looking, though, and you start comparing different mammals Dolphins, aardvarks, elephants, manatees, humans, chimpanzees, macaque, it doesn't really matter. What you find is that whereas the protein coding sequences are very well conserved, and whereas a lot of the DNA that's not protein coding is also highly conserved, when you look at the chromosomes and those banding patterns, those barcodes, it's akin to going into the grocery store. You see a bunch of black and white lines, right? You've seen one barcode, you've seen them all. But those barcodes are not the same. If they were the same, then you know you go and you're, I'm, I want green beans, and they say, no, you're buying a wrench or something like that. It doesn't work that way. Here's an example. Aardvark and human chromosomes. They look very similar at the DNA level when you take small snippets of them. When you look at how they're arranged in a linear pattern along a chromosome, they turn out to be very distinct. So when you get to the folder and the super folder in the higher order level, that's when you find these striking differences. And here's another example. They are now sequencing the nuclear DNA of Terciops truncatus. It's the Atlantic bottlenose dolphin. And when they started initially sequencing the DNA, and this is actually from the late 90s, and now it's a lot cheaper and it's faster, so we're getting a lot more data, but the first thing they realized is what? They said, basically, the dolphin genome is almost wholly identical to the human genome. That is, there are a few chromosome rearrangements here and there. You line the sequences, and they fit very well. Yet no one would argue, based on a statement like that, that bottlenose dolphin, Terciops, is closely related to us, our sister species, if you will. No one would presume to do that. So you would have to layer in some other assumption. But here's just a point. You'll see these statements throughout the literature of how common things are. When you look at the DNA sequences, the DNA data content, especially the parts lists, the proteins, they're very, very similar. They're shared with almost all mammals. But it's getting to those higher levels and how it is used where you find tremendous differences. Yet the interesting thing about these tremendously different uh, genetic regulatory networks that are species specific, which Dr. Sternberg talked about, is that if you mess with them, the results are always catastrophically bad. Eric Davidson, who is a developmental biologist, puts the situation like this. There is always an observable consequence if the developmental gene regulatory network subcircuit is interrupted. Since these consequences are always catastrophically bad, flexibility is minimal, and since the subcircuits are all interconnected, 
the whole network partakes of the quality that there is only one way for things to work. And indeed, the embryos of each species develop in only one way. Dr. Paul Nelson, in a lecture on ontogenetic depth, put the situation like this. Animal body plans are built in each generation by a stepwise process, from the fertilized egg to the many cells of the adult. The earliest stages in this process determine what follows. Thus, to change, that is, to evolve, any body plan, mutations expressed early in development must occur, be viable, and be stably transmitted to offspring. But such early acting mutations of global effect are those least likely to be tolerated by the embryo. Thus, where Darwinists must need plasticity in the genome to be viable as a theory in the developmental gene regulatory networks is a place where mutations are found to be always catastrophically bad. Yet it is exactly in this area of the genome regulatory networks where substantial orders of magnitude differences are found between even the supposedly closely related species of chimps and humans. Needless to say, since Darwinian evolution presupposes the unlimited plasticity of organisms, this is the exact opposite finding for what would have been predicted for what should have been found in the genome. If Darwinian evolution were a normal science that was subject to rigorous testing, this finding by itself should have been more than enough to falsify neo-Darwinian claims. Moreover, the 99% figure is uh, not as hard and fast as uh, most people assume. In a humorous article entitled, Guy Walks Into a Bar and Thinks He's a Chimpanzee, Dr. Richard Sternberg states, One can seriously call into question the statement that human and chim gen genomes are 99% identical. Part of the reason for this is if one decides to take into account the plethora of species-specific DNA insertions and deletions that are present along any segment compared between chimp and human, the percentage of identity drops. Another reason is that duplications, inversions, translocations, and transpositions at all scales uniquely characterize the two genome sequences. These have to be untangled before aligning the sequences in order to measure their similarity. Also, the 99% identity figure is often derived from protein coding regions that only comprise about 1.5% of the two genomes. In short, the figure of identity that one wants to use is dependent on various methodological factors. In an article entitled Complete Reanalysis of Chimpanzee and Human Genome Wide DNA Similarity, Jeffrey P. Tompkins stated, In summary, it can be fairly well stated that the chimpanzee genome is not 98 to 99 percent similar to humans, but at most no more than about 88 percent similar overall. However, there are several caveats that must be considered. First, the chimpanzee genomic sequence used in this study was assembled onto the human genome as a framework and thus does not stand on its own merits. The actual genome similarity with human, even using the high-end estimate of 80% for just the alignable regions, 
is realistically only about 80% or less when cytogenetic data is taken into account. In a more recent article entitled Genetic Gap Widens Between Humans and Chimps, Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins states, we now have a new set of 1,307 genes that are completely different between humans and chimpanzees. It goes on to state, in every genome there are sets of genes which are unique to that particular species, lacking homologs in any other species. They represent just a subset of the genes unique to chimp and human. The researchers only analyze genes expressed in liver, heart, brain, and testes. Many other bodily tissues still need to be examined. Many other genes in the genome are not spliced and were not included in the study. And here's a, another interesting paper that came out recently in October of 2015 entitled Unexpe Unexpected Features of the Dark Proteome. In it, the authors state, we surveyed the dark proteome, that is, regions of proteins never observed by experimental structure determination and inaccessible to homology modeling. We found that 44 to 54% of the proteome in eukaryotes and viruses was dark. Surprisingly, most of the dark proteome could not be accounted for by conventional explanations, such as intrinsic disorder or transmembrane regions. I would like to touch on one more area where there are dramatic differences between chimps and humans. Dr. Ian Tattersall who is a paleoanthropologist of the American Museum of Natural History, states, there is certainly no evidence to support the notion that we gradually became who we inherently are over an extended period in either the physical or the intellectual sense. And in this paper, Dr. Tatterstall states, unusual though Homo sapiens may be morphologically, it is undoubtedly our remarkable cognitive qualities that most strikingly demarcate us from all other extinct species. Human beings alone, it seems, mentally dissect the world into a multitude of discrete symbols and combine and recombine those symbols in their minds to produce hypotheses of alternative possibilities. When exactly Homo sapiens acquired this unusual ability is the subject of debate. What's interesting about humans having a unique ability to understand and communicate a information is that both life and the universe itself are information theoretic in their foundational basis. In this paper it is stated the grammar of the human genetic code is more complex than that of even the most intric intricately constructed spoken languages in the world. The findings explain why the human genome is so difficult to decipher. And in this paper, we find that John Wheeler states, in short, all matter and all things physical are information theoretic in their origin, and this is a participatory universe. It is hard to imagine a more convincing proof that we are made in the image of God 
than finding that both the universe and life itself are information theoretic in their foundational basis, and that we, of all the creatures on earth, uniquely possess an ability to understand and create information.